All right. So as we've been looking at this, going down our list over time here, Let's see here, yep, we got our thing working. So we've done sun, we've done water, and now we're going to be talking about minerals. And we got soil and heat too to talk about. So minerals, now we are going to be covering things that maybe not completely classified as minerals, more nutrients, uh, since nitrogen isn't officially a uh, mineral, but it's kind of a, a general term that we can use to think about things, or just nutrients too. So, so nutrients come in through the soil and roots and the leaves. Um, naturally, they come in through the leaves, like in places like near the coast, where there's a lot of uh, seawater coming through the air as a mist, and a lot of minerals are dissolved in that. Hi, Debbie. Um, so they fall on the leaves and they can get absorbed that way. And in other places where we're nowhere near the coast, so that's we're a little bit too far away for that effect to take, we can apply them as a foliar spray, as in put them in a water solution and spray them on the leaves in the, a form that the plants can use and we can feed them that way in efficiencies. Um, they can also be applied as a powder form or in forms of compost uh, to the soil as well, especially like when you're, when you're planting out, you can add stuff to the beds um, right before you plant or afterwards um, to feed the, feed the, the plants uh, minerals that they may have gotten used up or their soil is kind of deficient in. Um, so there are about 21 essential minerals for plants. Uh, that can vary, depends on what source you look. You may see 17. Uh, there are a few extras that are, can be included in essential, as in if the plant has absolutely none of them, it will be sickly and not do well. Um, a lot of the minerals that farmers put on, now some, it all depends. There's, you can't have a blanket statement that you know, all farmers do a poor job. There's a lot of good farmers out there that know what they're doing and you know, apply a lot of good minerals. Um, but there are majority of them that only apply you know, maybe three major ones and then a few extras. Um, so that'd be ni nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the three major ones and then you have sulfur and uh, calcium are the extras that generally get added and maybe a few extras if they have done their research and feel that it's needed um, but that's enough to generally make a plant look good and produce something um, and maybe you get a nice head of lettuce it maybe have diseases and therefore they have to uh, spray for pests as well as you know, fungus and things like that but you can get a, a crop and ship it out and it can be full and look nice, um, but it doesn't mean that the plant is healthy. And so one of the things as a gardener we have a little bit more ability to control is to feed our plants a little bit better and give uh, good healthy plants so that they will have a full range of minerals so when we eat them we get the health benefits of that because generally uh, plants are a better source of minerals than a vitamin or mineral pill would be. Much more absorbable because there's other chemicals that interact with that. Um, in fact, I don't know if you know this, but beta carotene, they, they can extract it out of carrots and other um, forms and, or plants and they can put it into a pill and it'll say it's beta, beta carotene on there and you think you're getting your uh, getting it and it's been, going to be beneficial, but it was actually found to be uh, carcinogenic. In fact, you know when it's in its isolated form, it's a carcinogen. So, but it's not when it's when you eat the carrot, which is a uh, main source of it. It isn't at all. So uh, there's there can be negative consequences, um, as opposed to even just neutral. Maybe it doesn't benefit you at all, but there can actually be negative. Uh, reasons not to take minerals in a pill form. Um, let's see here, needed for photosynthesis process. So um, normally if you remember right, I remember what, I, what we talked about before, we need water 
for photosynthesis. That's part of it. It has to come out from the roots generally. And we need carbon dioxide coming in from the air. And what's the other driving factor for photosynthesis? Sunlight. Okay, those are the main things, but without certain minerals, that process can't take place. And so if your plant is deficient in that, in those minerals, just has some, it's not gonna, it's gonna be able to photosynthesize a little bit, but not do a very good job of it. So one thing we can look at is which minerals are needed for that and how we can um, make sure the plant has enough of those so we can photosynthesize well and drive the whole system, create the sugars, which will feed the biology in the soil, which will extract the minerals that are in the soil and feed the plant and give it what it needs. Uh, also needed just for plant, the growing process of cell division and transportation of the sugars throughout the plants and all that kind of stuff, the energy and converting nitrogen into amino acids and things like that. So here's a nice little list of required nutrients. Um, so we have two categories, macro meaning large and micro, oops, did I miss that? Um, this should be micro, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Didn't go back and look at the slide. So macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, micro just meaning small and of you know, significantly less quantity needed. Um, you could also use the term trace minerals. So we got nitrogen at the top, that's, that's always needed, and phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. So those are the big guys that you need the most of. And that's generally the list that most farmers will add. And then from the air, plant also needs carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, and then hydrogen and oxygen. And I have a nice list of what the air actually contains as well. Um, and then we got our micronutrients or trace minerals. So we got boron, copper, chlorine, iron, zinc, nickel, which is not, it, it is needed, but it has a very small role in the plant. So if you, if you miss that, you won't be missing a whole lot. Um, we got manganese, uh, molybdenum, cobalt, silicon, selenium, and sodium. And so as we go through here, try to th uh, pay attention to the letters here because this is kind of like a, the scientific notation on the periodic table and a lot of times you'll see that and not anything else. And you'll ha and have it kind of practice remembering these and saying, oh, I know what N is and I know what P is and K and CA and some of these. Um, some of these are fairly evident, you know, ZN, you could probably figure that out. FE, you know, that's a fairly common one. So I think, you know, um, it can, you can decipher it fairly easily, but sometimes they don't always look exactly like copper. Well, there's no U in copper, but it's still CU. Um, chlorine is CL. That's, so the second letter is always going to be a lowercase. Um, malignanum. Manganese, so we've got a G. So those two can be a little bit confusing because they're, you know, they both have G, MG in them, <laughs> just in a different place. So there just happens to be an N before the G in manganese, so that can help you remember that one. Um, cobalt, which can be confused with copper since they both start with CO, so that can be, just have to remember that one. Silicon fairly easily, selenium, so the kind of the first. And then NA, I don't remember, I don't, I don't think I've ever looked up why NA, but that's what it is, so we'll go with that. Well, it's another SO, so <laughs> they couldn't do SO again. <laughs> that was out, so that was already used. All right, so here is a nice little list of all the nutrients up here at the top, and then a list of, we're not gonna go dive into this particular chart, but just so there's a nice little list here um, of all the different uses in the plant. And we'll look at each one of those uses for each one of the minerals. So if you wanna take a picture, 
as someone who's already trying. <laughs> I will pause. <laughs> Okay, so here's a little nutrient deficiency symptoms. And so we can take a look at some of the characteristics of the leaves. We got, um, this is kind of like the new growth stuff at the top. So you know, the symptoms will be a little bit different when they're up at the top there. So you'll see stunted growth and misshapen leaves can mean a calcium deficiency. And then iron deficiency, you get uh, um, yellow and white old uh, old growth will appear normal but the y yellow and white and the new leaves that are coming out indicate an iron deficiency uh, we got manganese we've got spots and holes we got if it's a nitrogen deficiency it's a kind of an overall general yellowing very yellowish green appearance to the leaves uh, old growth yellow and wilted new growth light green and then potassium yellowing in the tips and the edges as indicative right here kind of in the vein area for potassium um, phosphorus can also have kind of a purplish on the bottom of the leaf appearance um, loss of leaves dark hue so kind of a darkening of the leaf um, which can be a little bit hard to decipher because Abundance of iron can also make a dark green leaf too. That's healthy, but generally if it doesn't quite look as healthy as it should notice the veins Are a little lighter than they should be. They're going to be a little on the light side or They should be fairly consistent um, between the In between the leaf, in between the veins and the veins themselves should be the same color and then carbon dioxide leaves die stunted growth So those are some basic things we can take a keep in mind. Um, yeah, dark veins, light leaves. So if you can see these darkening of the veins, then that would be mag magnesium, which is another um, magnesium sulfate is Epsom salt. In case you wanted to go to the grocery store and buy your minerals there. Uh, there we go. Okay, so what do the numbers mean? So when we look at um, atoms and molecules, um, here's a good, give you an idea of what we're looking at here. So the number of proteins in an atom is called the atomic number. And so um, this, the protons are gonna be in the middle and you're gonna have electrons going around it and, or neutrons too. Neutrons also go around it. So your electrons are negatively charged protons are positively charged and your neutrons are neutral as in neither one and there can be multiple circles kind of like planets going around the sun the same creator created both and so our solar system can be a good visual example for how we can understand how it works on the microscopic level um, so then the number of protons and the number of neutrons determine an element's mass number. So there's a couple different numbers that you'll see on the periodic table. There's an atomic mass of a single atom is simply its total mass and typically expressed as um, a atomic mass units. Um, generally just a number, a count of the number of, you'll see a number of protons and then you'll see a a number of protons plus electrons and neutrons all together. So we'll take a look a little bit at that a little bit later as we look at some of them. So what is in our air? So this gives you an idea of what we're breathing in and what plants have access to. So you'll see that there's only basically two components of air, nitrogen and your oxygen. And then you get basically 1% is everything else. So you think, well, why can't plants just breathe in the nitrogen and have all they need, but they're not able to do, get it in that form. So we have to use biology in the soil to change it into a form that the plants can absorb through the roots. Um, and then you'll notice 
carbon dioxide is only 0.04 percent. So uh, there's there's sometimes a deficiency in carbon dioxide for the plants to breathe in, and so they can that can be a limiting factor in their growth. You know, they can if there isn't enough CO2 in the air around them, they've used it up already for the day. Um, that's around in that area, they can also not do too well. So wind can be a good thing, <laughs> you know, if it's a still day, you know, and there's a whole field of you know, all these plants are trying to soak up this carbon dioxide, then there can be a deficiency and so. It's funny that they put trace. So 0. 0.000002 is not, <laughs> it's not trace, but how so, much? Yeah, that isn't trace. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> it goes off the edge of the screen, right. so they decided not to. Thankfully, carbon monoxide, that all depends on where you're located. If you're by a tailpipe of a car, it may be a little higher. Not, not quite so trace. So what about your engine? If you're yeah. Just <laughs> Doesn't see this is, it's not saying this is a good thing, <laughs> that plants need it. This isn't what all plants need. This just what happens to be what's in the air, including Krypton there. Kryptonite? <laughs> yeah, from Superman. <laughs> So anyway, here's, so here's nitrogen, and we can take a look a little bit of what that's like here. So we got an atomic number of seven, so that would be the number of protons in the middle of it. So seven protons, and then you'll notice this number down here, 14. So this is the uh, atomic, uh, the mass, uh, atomic mass number, or yeah, the atomic mass. Um, so this tells you that there are, generally there are gonna be equal number of electrons to protons. So it, that means it's kind of like a balanced, it has a balance there. One, they're both, you know, positive and negative are, are balanced out. Um, if one gets knocked off, I think I was gonna look this up and I, from what I understand, the static electricity is you're knocking off electrons and therefore they, they cling to each other. When, they, when things cling to each other, that means that there's, a missing electron on one and, a, and an extra one on another one and they cling together. So, and then you can see where, discovered by this fellow here in 1772. So this is liquid nitrogen. So there's a certain temperature where um, super cold, it's a liquid and there's probably a t temperature that it does become a solid, but it boils at some super high negative value temperature. And it basically acts like boiling water. And it steams up and you know, bubbles and it looks just like boiling water. But it's super cold and you'd freeze your hand off in it if you put it in there at that temperature. Um, and then we have a form here that we usually would use as a fertilizer. Um, there's, let's see here, um, ammonium nitrate you can get which is fairly good, and then urea, and they have different uh, quantity of nitrogen in them, different percentages. I think urea is around 40% or something in that range. Um, and it's probably in the maybe 25 or so for ammonium sulfate. You'd have to look on the bag now, it's been a long time since I've um, looked at them, but those are good sources for just small amounts of nitrogen to use in a foliar spray because um, plants do need a little boost of nitrogen, so that can be helpful when they're young. Generally, when to use, you, well, even when they're big, yeah, it depends on, how, if they look like they're a little deficient, you could put a little nitrogen in your mix. All right, so there's that, and then, so it's needed for uh, nodulation, which is, uh, not all plants can do it, so legumes, generally are the ones, uh, and there's other nitrogen fixing plants, but they create little nodules of nitrogen um, with bacteria in the soil that are right next to the roots. They have a symbiotic relationship with these bacteria and they are able to produce uh, root nodules. And I'll show you a picture a little later on what that looks like. So nitrogen is needed for that process. And then photosynthesis. So nitrogen is needed for that process and protein production, as well as vegetative growth. So that's kind of the area that it governs. And then we have phosphorus. So, <clears throat> discovered in 1669 by this dude here. I'm not sure where, 
They're sometimes all over the place, you know, in different parts of the country. There's a couple of Swedish ones that discovered some different minerals. And so we have 15 protons and double that um, with the included electrons here. And then, so this is kind of what it looks like in more of a pure state, um, not a oxidized state. So there's different states of minerals and Generally, when you buy them in the store, they're they're called a sulfate because they're they're combined with sulfur to kind of kind of a stable form. In fact, a lot of minerals, when they have them in this pure form, you let it sit for maybe a couple hours, and it'll like change form, and it'll oxidize just like if you stuck um, a wet piece of uh, iron, raw iron, put a bunch of water on it, it'll and without it submerged, but you know just kind of damp, it'll rust fairly quickly within maybe a couple hours, you'll see a little rust forming on there, so it's oxidizing. And so each mineral has a little different, f it does, you know, it's not gonna rust, it's gonna have a different form, but generally we have more of an oxidized form. And that's not the form that plants can absorb it through their leaves, so we need to convert that to a form that they can use before we apply that. Okay, and then this is needed for carbohydrate production uh, vegetative growth, root growth, uh, energy transfer around the plant, uh, AT ATP or something like that. It's very similar to what humans, I think it's the same uh, chemical or whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure what the term for it is. <coughs> but that's kind of what the energy transfer is. And then nutrient uptake. So in the process of taking up the other minerals from the soil um, phosphorus is needed. Uh, we got potassium, which is our K. So, uh, 1807 discovered. And so we got 19 protons. And so you'll notice, see 19, it doesn't quite, let's see, that should be a, uh, 38. So that means there's probably a neutron in there. So if, you, so if the number, number down here doesn't equal double that, generally there's a neutron stuck in there somewhere, since the electrons are always going to equal the uh, protons. Um, so that's what that looks like here. And this is kind of the pure form of potassium. It's more of an alkali metal in its pure state. Um, we generally see it as um, kind of a rock form like that is how you usually will buy it, or something a little bit finer, maybe even a powder form. But it's generally going to have that kind of uh, milky color to it, kind of tan. Um, and then we got potassium, so that's good need, needed for photosynthesis. So take note of that one, because so we always need to look at things that are important for photosynthesis. Um, disease resistance, so if you don't have enough, you can get disease. Uh, we also got um, abiotic stress tolerances, and I do have a definition of that on one of the other ones down there, so we'll get to that. But it's basically things that would stress the plants, such as heat, um, drought, and there's another one too. That things that would stress the plants, and so it's, it helps with when the plant is in a stress state, potassium is good for that. Uh, carbohydrate production, vegetative growth, again, root growth. So generally people will say that you know, your potassium is going to be good for your fruit production and your uh, phosphorus is good for root production, but they do both. <laughs> There's definitely an overlap on both of them there. Um, and even vegetative growth too, which people say, oh, you only need, you know, nitrogen is good for vegetative growth. Well. These others are good, needed too. So, <clears throat> and then nutrient uptake again is needed for that, and water usage through the plant. So it's able to use water more efficiently, and with potassium, um, magnesium, Mg. On the periodic table here, we got 12 protons, and 12 and 12 is 24. So it's it's nice, no neutrons in that one. So this is kind of what it's really. Um, quite pretty the way it's in its pure form, another metal. So it's another alkaline earth. 
um, and this is kind of the state we get um, your Epsom salt magnesium sulfate or magne yeah, magnesium sulfate. So this is the form that you normally get it in. And then magnesium, yeah. So then needed for photosynthesis again. So that's another one. So both manganese and magnesium are required for photosynthesis. So you can remember the two Mg and Mn. Um, carbohydrate production, protein production, oil production. So those are the, what you'd see in the leaves. They, they produce like essential oils. Uh, vegetative growth again, it's needed for that. Hormone, metabolism, energy transfer, and nutrient uptake. Uh, we got sulfur, it's another one to pay attention to. Um, so this is a, a non-metal and it's no, been known from ancient times. The uh, documentation I think that I got it from said 9000 BC and I'm like, nah, <laughs> don't think so. <laughs> I'll just change it to ancient times. Um, so people know about sulfur, yeah, so it's and that, the reason why they know about it, because you can get it out of volcanoes. In fact, in uh, Nepal, I think, they still are harvesting it from the volcanoes. They're going in there with their chipping away at it and hauling it out. Um, normally, it is harvested or extracted from petroleum-based products. There's a small amount in there and that they can, they can clean out the sulfur out of to make when they make gasoline and the other natural gas and yeah oh you know what I forgot I was going to be doing that pass it around Let's see here. Let's see here so what did we start at okay so we got forgot nitrogen so you can take a look at that one we got phosphorus. Nitrogen. <laughs> yeah, they each have a different scent, so that's that's probably the, the most way to recognize them than just by the smell of them. Not too bad. So we got potassium. And we'll see dissolved iron, boron, copper, and then magnesium. So that's your Epsom salt there. Oh yeah. Looks like it. Shiny. Yep. Okay. So now we're caught up here. <laughs> Too many things to think about. <laughs> All right. So sulfur. Some of the things that sulfur is good for nodulation again for um, for legume type plants. And then photosynthesis, needed for that. So this is another major one. Notice another photosynthesis one. So that's generally in my mix that I spray on plants when they're not doing well or just to give them a boost. Uh, keep, them, keep them healthy. Disease, resents, re, disease resistance. So it helps with different diseases. So the mix you spray on when they don't look healthy is sulfur what? Um, I will get to that at the end. <laughs> So that's kind of the application part of it. Um, but yeah, sulfur is one of them. Uh, oil production, vegetative growth, again, energy transfer. So this is a fairly important one. And I do have, let's see here. Does that work? Oh. Oops. Let's see here, I don't have speaker output here. to Panasonic TV. Let's see if that works. DMT sulfuric hey, is go. a proven technology. The technology is reliable and very cost efficient. The system has a high uptime, is very safe, and the gas leaving the system is of outstanding quality. DMT's Sulfurex VR is a biological process for the removal of hydrogen sulfide from gas streams. This environmentally friendly technology guarantees the H2S removal as a high uptime and enables industries to meet stringent gas quality requirements. The process is divided into three sections. The absorption section, 
Hydrogen sulfide rich gas enters the absorption section of the system and streams upwards. Wash solution is pumped from the bioreactor to the top of the absorber and is sprayed over the packing to ensure contact between the solution and the gas. The purified gas flows upwards to the top of the absorber. The bioreactor section. The wash solution used in the system is an alkaline solution. Due to a physical chemical reaction in the absorber, the H2S is dissolved as a sulfide molecule. The sulfur bacteria present in the wash solution do not take part in the reaction. The H2S solution falls in the sump part of the absorber and it flows into the bioreactor section. Now, air is let into the system to help the sulfur bacteria convert the sulfide into elemental sulfur and caustic. Bacteria eat the sulfide present in the liquid and excrete elemental sulfur. The elemental sulfur used is hydrophilic and therefore doesn't cause clogging. The wash solution is regenerated and can be pumped in the absorption section for a new process cycle. This saves a lot of cost for costing. The settler section. Part of the wash solution is pumped to a settler. The weight of the sulfur settles down and concentrates to a 10 to 15% sulfur slurry. The settler overflow is reused in the process. The biosulfur produced can be used as a very effective fertilizer. Sulfur XBR uses no additional oxygen, has low operational cost, and is beneficial for high sulfur load plants. Sulfur XBR. Anyway, you get the idea. So, that, so that's where sulfur normally comes from. As you said, that's the majority of the source. And so volcanoes are a very small source of sulfur anymore, but it does pay the people that harvest it fairly well. So they put their lives in jeopardy for to do that. <laughs> they said they live to be about 50 or something like that be, before they die. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of pain in their backs and so like that because it's like 200 pounds or something that they have to hike up in these baskets and you know bare backs and they have this like wooden piece that they put over their shoulder and carry it up and it's pretty sad. I was going to show that one, but then I said, well, <laughs> maybe not. You can look at it <laughs> on your own. Um, anyway, so calcium is another important one. Think about here and calcium, calcium. So this is agri agricultural lime is the name that you usually would buy it in the form of. Um, calcium carbonate is the official um, uh, what did you want to say here? The, um, the form, the form that it's in, calcium carbonate. And that would be this, this stuff here. Humphrey Davy, yep. Um, so then calcium is a soft, silvery metal at room temperature. Uh, left alone, it will quickly oxidize in, in the air, forming a dull gray patina. So you can also find um, agricultural lime in a gray form too. Uh, it's probably mined from different locations and just happens to be whatever. I'm not sure how they get it white. Maybe they bleach it, but I doubt it. Um, it's probably just different locations and they have different characteristics of it. But um, so don't think you have the right wrong product if you get open the bag and it's gray or you open it if it's in a pure white. I mean, it, it's white as white can be when you look at it, as you can see in the picture here and in there. Um, and that's a lot of times what's in your pills. <laughs> they put calcium or they put it in your breakfast cereal as a calcium source. So it is edible just in small quantities. Um, it's good for nodulation again, uh, disease resistance. So if uh, plants are lacking in calcium, that can be, they can get some diseases. Um, okay, here's the definition. Drought, salinity means uh, salt in the soil, and extreme temperatures. So those are the, the stresses. Uh, we've got vegetative growth again, root growth, and water usage. So those are all the what's needed. It's a, and it needs quite a bit of it. So calcium and boron are the two that tend to leach out of the soil very quickly. Boron over the, and what? And this calcium here. Okay. Uh, that's why farmers generally will put on calcium every year because it tends to, uh, it's water soluble and it just, the water takes it on down out of reach of the plants. 
and then the soil becomes uh, so ca this um, calcium is um, alkaline and so it will if you have acidic soil it will bring up the pH or if you have neutral soil it'll bring it up even more so if you have seven you know 7.58 on the pH scale soil you want to be very careful about adding too much lime um, in fact uh, this is cheap there is a there is a form of calcium that you can add called <coughs> excuse me uh, gypsum which is the same stuff they use in gypsum walls uh, drywall so you can actually grind up drywall it's a big pain it does not grind up very well because of the little uh, fiberglass fibers that are intermixed in there but you can extract it out of there if you're feeling very poor or that's all you got um, but it I can't remember. I, I always, always, whenever I look at the price, I'm like, <gasps> uh, maybe not. <laughs> it's high. I can't remember what the price per pound is, but it's, it's extremely expensive compared to the lime. You know, lime, you can get a 50 pound bag for around eight, ten dollars. The gypsum's probably over a hundred or something like that for a 50 pound bag. So lime is calcium? Yes, calcium carbonate. Um, gypsum is another form of calcium, which has a different, I don't know the official name of that other than gypsum. So does gypsum have other things, what makes it more expensive then? <sighs> Just more rare, I'm sure. It's harder to get where they can get it. Um, so, so that is how you add calcium to plants that like um, acidic soils or reduced soils, such as blueberries. Yeah. You're supposed to add gypsum, not lime. But they still need calcium, so that's about the only choice to add calcium is to add gypsum. So what do you add to your blueberries? Uh, gypsum? Nothing. <laughs> I haven't bought any yet, and I'm not sure I want to. They seem to do okay, so I just kind of let. they they got to fend for themselves out of the soil. <laughs> <laughs> not for calcium. What about eggshells? Can you add eggshells to it? Well, they're calcium carbonate, so they'll increase the pH of the soil. You can add a few. I mean, you can always add a little bit. It's not like you can't add a little bit. Uh, they just don't want to add a cup full around your plant, each plant. Then they would probably not start to not do well. Um, it also oxidizes the soil too, cal calcium carbonate. So that's one thing that plants don't all, don't appreciate either. It can increase their chances of getting diseases um, when it oxidizes soil. So um, generally, there's enough in the soil but you know it's it depends I, I haven't really figured out all the logistics of when to add and how much and you know what's what when does it become a problem when, when it doesn't but you know adding some every few years just to your garden good good sprinkling over your all your beds is a good practice just to make sure that they do have enough calcium available um, but there's a lot of you know, locked up calcium. So there's different forms. So there's the calcium that's readily available, like calcium carbonate. The plants can readily use that. Um, but there's other tied up forms of it in the soil that the biology has to unlock and change to a different form in order for the plants to have access to what's maybe stored in the soil itself. So soil is mainly, you know, it's got a lot of dead plant material in there, but it's also minerals too. But they're generally in a form that the um, the plants can't use majority of it. It's like a big, you know, it's basically rocks that have been de decayed and weathered over time. But they're not the plants just can't just extract them out of there themselves very easily. They have a little bit of acid that they can do a little bit, but not very easily. So um, calcium. So yeah, we talked about what is there. Boron. That's another important one. But so so this is where we get into the micro nutrient or the trace mineral stage where we want to use significantly less in our foliar sprays of boron than we would of like phosphorus. And so this is a metalloid, so it's a metallic in its properties. And so we got five protons and double that for the elect including the electrons, another five electrons. And we get it normally in the form of borax. Um, in fact, the word borax was around before boron was. 
Um, so these, these guys here discovered boron and they, someone was able to extract boron from the borax, which can be a naturally occurring substance in the earth. Um, I don't remember what part of the country that it comes from, but there are... Where's, that's where the borax, that's where they do most of it. And where's that? I don't recognize the... California. Oh, okay. By the Mojave Desert. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, that's what that is. And then it's needed for disease resistance. So that's an <laughs> important one. And another stress tolerance. Vegetative growth. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of soils are deficient in boron since it does leach out with a lot of rain. So in rainy climates, you're going to need to add it where, you know, more deserty climates, you don't need to add it because it doesn't wash out. Um, important for root growth and vegetative growth, so it's kind of very important. <laughs> um, generally, that's something I add to almost all my sprays. Nutrient uptake. So when people see like calcium deficiencies, especially in like tomatoes, usually means they aren't watering enough. And that also means that um, they're usually deficient in boron. So I think if I remember right, um, calcium is locked up and it really can't be transported into the plant easily when it's too dry. And boron also I think functions in that capacity as well, where it's give it, if it gets too dry, then the plants can't uptake the calcium and the boron that they need. But um, boron, if boron is deficient and you have plenty of calcium, you can add all this calcium and it still isn't doing any good. That means you're probably deficient in boron, so you need to add some of that to the, uh, the soil as well as maybe a foliar spray. Um, and then nutrient uptake mentioned there. So the nutrient would be calcium in this case and water usage. So, um, and so the boron increase, uh, increases, guides, uh, sugar translocation, nice big word there, but trans, transporting location type thing. So, you know, the idea of what the word means, basically moving it around um, to the sugar sinks. So those would be places in the leaves that, and the stem, uh, mainly in the leaves where they need the sugars to, for growth. Um, and then also into the fruit. Fruit would be a location where it's going to be trans helping to transport it. When a crop approaches maturity, we can speed up the maturing time um, and help the plant move a lot of sugars and nutrients into the seed, fruit, um, and the plant structure. Uh, like onions or cabbage heads, results in higher gains. So if you can, when it gets towards the time where you want to be harvesting your fruit, uh, you can add some boron in there to speed up the process of getting the, sweet, the fruit sweeter and or um, bigger heads of cabbage or onions and things like that to mature the plant a little bit faster and a little higher quality. Um, boron increases calcium absorption and mobility. Um, moves, so allows calcium to move through the xylem, which we learned about in a previous class. That's the tubes that go up from the roots up to the center of the plant stem. And anyone remember what the other? Phloem. Very good. Phloem. Phloem, I think. Yeah, phloem. Phloem, yeah. Okay, so then uh, during the summer heat, calcium becomes slower and settles in the lower older leaves. So you can have calcium deficiencies in the upper new growth. Okay. Um, let's see, adequate boron increases plant resistance to all these terrible things here. So we got viruses, pathogens, fungus, bacteria. 
So boron is very important. So it's all you can get these diseases if you have a lack of boron too. So. And then we have copper. So that would be Cu. And this is a transition metal. And you'll see a lot in the middle of the periodic table near the top is kind of all these transition metals. So copper being one of them here. So we got 29 protons and 63. So you'll notice there's a discrepancy there, double 29. So 30 and 30 is 60 minus 2. Uh, 58 electrons. So we got some new neutrons floating around in there. Uh, so that's what it looks like in its pure form, like a copper penny. And this is what it looks like, <laughs> surprisingly, in its oxidized state. Okay, so... Oop. Sorry, boron. <laughs> got to see if you guys can remind me to pass these around here. Okay, so then copper, okay. Copper, the blue version. Isn't that neat? And that has, I think it's, oh. yeah, smell, smell it. See if he has a, you smell something? I, yeah, I'm not sure what it is. So. <laughs> That's copper. <laughs> That's what it is. It probably smells like a penny. <laughs> so. All right, so copper is needed for photosynthesis again. So that's another important one to take note of. Disease resistance. So those are kind of the two important ones we need to think about because generally when we have disease, we we'll think about what's the plant deficient in. And so copper is another one that's a fairly major one. Um, but not in smaller, it's still in the trace quantity. So as opposed to a full teaspoon and copper sulfate is kind of poisonous. So. Don't lick your fingers. <laughs> Wear gloves or be very careful on working with it since it is toxic to humans and at a certain level. Um, so yeah, disease resistance, another stress tolerance, uh, carbohydrate production, veg uh, vegetative growth, hormone metabolism, energy transfer. So as you can see from the length of the list, kind of important one. Um, adequate levels of copper in the plant provide cell, stem, and fruit skin elasticity and flex flexibility. Um, so it allows plants to move and flex and do this kind of stuff without snapping. Yeah, a little flex, <laughs> a little copper. <laughs> Rub a little copper on your skin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, but um, so that's in, uh, something important. So tomato skins. Um, bark on some certain plants can be helped. So uh, when you have a lot of splitting of your tomatoes or other fruit, when they get a lot of too much water at once, um, so it probably means they're low in copper. Uh, adequate copper increases plant resistance too. You'll see this is a, and then we have a nice list of all these diseases again, uh, damping off, root rot, uh, downy mildew and powdery mildew. So um, if you ever see the powdery mildew on your squash, that would be something to think about adding to the li uh, list there. Um, so people usually spray plants with copper to kill bacterial infections on the surface. So it is also a fungicide and pest uh, bacteria side on the surface of leaves. <clears throat> Um, you can have the same effects and more uh, by getting the copper inside the plant as a nutritional supplement. So use copper at, in a different form uh, with a different approach. So the approach is to get it as a nutrient, that it's like a vitamin pill for the plant to take it inside and have all these beneficial effects of resisting disease rather than just spraying it on the surface to kill off what happens to be growing on the surface because you're also killing off a lot of good bacteria. So it's kind of like, um, what do you want to say, the amoxicillin for p humans where you clean everything out <laughs> and everything dies and that's not a good thing. Um, so we don't want to try not to use it in large quantities that would kill everything off the plant. So it's, when you're talking about a quarter of a teaspoon 
or something like about like that to a gallon, a couple of gal uh, to a gallon of water or so, then it's not really um, going to be killing off stuff on the surface too much. It's going to be in a fairly low quantity. And so then, should you like water the soil more and not get it on the leaves? No, you want to put it on the leaves because you want it to, the plant. You want to get inside the plant. Um, and it'll also kill off bacteria in the soil too, which can be a problem. Bad bacteria. <laughs> all of them, yeah. all of the above. So it's generally it can build up in the soil over time if people are using it constantly. They're spraying their fields with it as a as a fungicide, um, and so it's something to not to be careful with, not apply too much, because it doesn't just disappear. Once it's there, it's uh, kind of there until the plants take it up. But the plants may be, once it, it, it's may to be in a wrong form, and if the bacteria aren't converting it to a form the plants can, can handle, then it just sits there and could be a problem as far as killing off the biology in the soil. All right, let's see here. So, um, <clears throat> so this is a chlorine. So this is what chlorine looks like. Probably have seen it in when you do laundry or are cleaning bleach or cleaning. Oh yeah, someone told me that bleach or bleach isn't always the best for killing fungus or uh, what's it, not, it's not fungus, what's it, the uh, mold? mold yeah. yeah, it's better to use vinegar to kill it off with. It's much healthier for the people that are working around it. Mm. Oh, um, you go from one toxic to another. Yeah, and you're breathing the toxins and also it, it, someone mentioned it was like, uh, created another chemical, like reacts, and then it creates a, another toxic chemical that you have to breathe. So, um, I haven't, this isn't something we probably need to pay a whole lot of attention to. I just put it on the list because someone else did in one of the essentials. But I, you know, um, there's, there's some, some things it helps with, but I haven't figured out how to apply it and if it even is needed. Um, like, well, I mean, it's needed, but whether or not it needs to be added at all, whether or not there's a deficiency or how would plant get it. So I really don't have a lot of information other than uh, this list of things that it is useful for. So it is photosynthesis, is there in disease resistance, but how, how and how much, I don't know at this point. So maybe in, as I do more research, I'll let you guys know what I find out here. But, and then we got iron. So I didn't bring uh, bleach with me, so. <laughs> Um, iron. Where's my iron? There we go. So this kind of has, oh, mine's, mine's kind of green actually, <laughs> but it has a very oh, yeah. recognizable, <laughs> when, you, when you smell it, it's like, oh, that smells like metal. <laughs> very metallic smell to it. Not, a, not, fair, not very pleasant. <laughs> so 26, so this is a little heavier. Notice, you know, so this, this actually does relate to the, the weight of it, the density. So you'll see a hydrogen atom, which is super lightweight. It only has two. It has a proton and an electron going around it. That's, the hydrogen is the lightest element. And then helium, uh, helium is like the second. It's got like maybe three, uh, two or three electrons and, and three or maybe it's two, I can't remember now what it is, but it's fairly small too. So as we get bigger numbers, think of heavier, heavier elements. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like when it's not oxidized. Uh, basically just metal, what you normally see iron. Uh, and then this is, they, sh they show red, I don't know. <laughs> Mine isn't red, <laughs> so it's maybe a little different form that I found a picture of. Uh, the Egyptians, had artifacts made out of it, 3,500 BC. I don't know if the t date is, well, I don't know. That's, that's about when the Egyptians were around, I think. It's hard to know for sure. Well, four, yeah, see, well, mm, I think that is off. Because, you know, I'm only thinking 4,000 years. It's probably a, maybe 1,000 years before the flood, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, we, yeah, because we have, right, because Adam, you know, he was 930. So that's almost a thousand years, and so it's probably not quite that, <laughs> not that far back for the Egyptian society there. Okay, so needed for 
Um, nodulation again, photosynthesis. So it's, this is another important one that plants are a lot of times deficient in. Even though we have a lot of iron in the soil, it's in the wrong form. And if you don't have good biology to convert it, it's a lot of times unavailable and can you, deficient. Can you tell us what kind of iron um, that you buy? Um, so that would be iron sulfate. Generally, if you put the word sulfate after anything that you want to look for, um, then that's the form that's available in. Uh, there's a, maybe a few exceptions to that, like lime isn't lime sulfate. It's just lime, calcium carbonate, but yeah. Um, so yeah, disease resistance again, uh, stress, energy transfer. So iron is not a part of chlorophyll, not, not part of its structure, but it is required to assemble chlorophyll. So in order for the plant to be creating these chlorophyll, um, cells, I guess they are. Um, it needs iron to do that. Plants will have a dark green and lush appearance with adequate levels of iron. That's why dark leafy greens are recommended for getting your iron. Iron can greatly increase uh, photosynthetic efficiency. Uh, iron is needed for all the uh, I was trying to remember that pigments. <laughs> this word <laughs> Carotenoids or something. I can't I remember hearing it, but I can't remember now how it's. Okay, you guys figured it out better than I can. That's that sounds right. <laughs> Chlorophyll, which absorbs different spectrums of light. So this is kind of the light spectrum here. So we got radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and this kind of gives you an idea of um, the frequency. The fast, the closer together and the faster, you know, closer together the waves are. Um, which is called the frequency. Um, so if you got the radio waves are big and long, that's why they're able to transfer, uh, tr uh, transmit very long distances because they're big and so the higher the frequency, things get in the ways like walls will interfere with high frequency waves. So light is somewhere here in the middle, and this so this is what we call the visible light spectrum from. And we actually have a measurement, 700 nanometers up to uh, 400 nanometers. That's the gap spacing between one peak. So from this, the distance between this peak and the next peak, that's, that's the uh, rating right down there. 700 starts on the low end and then up to 400 is tight like that. So plants are able to absorb light in the visible spectrum that we see. And so this is a representation of that spectrum. And so the colors are also indicative of that. Um, so this is kind of in reverse. So we got 700 over here. Um, so, so you see that <laughs> these are backwards from each other. Don't ask me why they did that, but they did. So red is over here and then red is over here on this side. So this is at the 700 and this goes over to three, 350. So 400 is somewhere in this range. So you see the... Um, so why are plants green? Anyone know why they're green? Yeah, but why? What's the mechanism? Or why does my shirt look blue? Or <laughs> reflection of the light or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so we have green in this area where there's, so these little peaks are where the plant is ab absorbing light. And there's this area where they're not absorbing light. And so what colors in leaves do you see? Green, yellow leaves, and red leaves, right? Trees and things like that. And um, those are the, because those are being reflected back. And the colors you don't see are the ones that are being absorbed. And so the reason why this looks red is because everything else is being absorbed. All the colors are being absorbed, the frequencies, but the red one is being reflected back as light to our eyes. So that isn't red, That's it's everything besides red. <laughs> so leaves are everything, they absorb all the colors besides green when they're nice and green. So anyway, um, so iron allows plants to have a wider array of colors that they are able to absorb. And so they're able to do absorb uh, eight to 10 times wider bandwidth of light. Um, because it creates these pigments and pigments are the same thing that causes our clothes to be a certain color 
um, they uh, are transmitting the photons into the chlorophyll in order to um, get those photons in there and then they do the photosynthesis process. But the iron's very important for doing that, so that's why it's important. Uh, and then we got zinc. So uh, this is another transitional metal and you'll see it's another 55. Whoops, that's wrong. Sorry. <laughs> uh, is that? Is that a, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Pay attention to the information up here. <laughs> Actually, maybe not. Okay, let's just skip that slide. <laughs> That's wrong. <clears throat> okay, needed for photosynthesis, stress, protein production, vegetative growth, hormone, hormone metabolism. So zinc, zinc determines leaf size and uniform shape. So if you have a lot of irregular sh shaped leaves, that can be a zinc deficiency. Um, adequate zinc levels, you will see larger and wider leaves rather than long, skinny ones. You'll see fat, chubby ones. So ununiform shape, so would that include curl leaf? Like, not really, no. no. It's more the shape, the outline, whether or not it's kind of weird, like weird jaggedies or um, one's, one's wide and one's skinny and okay. they all kind of look a little different. Curling usually is a kind of a fungal disease or some other type of disease that's causing that. Or it's trying to, or cupping can mean they're trying to protect themselves from losing so much water. So you'll see in really hot weather, they'll, they'll cup themselves. I think it's generally cupping up, protect themselves because they're uh, evaporating. I think the water goes out the top. I can't remember that. No, no, it comes out the bottom. So I think, so the leaves, I think, would probably cut down. And then that's because the little mouths, the stomata, little mouths in the bottom of the leaves where the water comes out. So they, they're trying to cup that and kind of protect themselves from so much water loss. Um, so it also increases, so zinc is really good for humans as well. It keeps the viruses from being able to replicate inside the cell. Um, and so it's also important for plants too, the resistance to rhizoctonia, fusarium, phytophthora, potato scab, mosaic virus, and aflatoxins in grain, which you may have heard of. Those are, I think those are actually in like peanuts too or something. There's a certain level that can be beyond that is not legal and can be harmful. Uh, I think that has to do with like mold or something growing on the grain and can create aflatoxins. So anyway, here's another uh, indication. The main one you'll see is this. Um, the, so this is called the petiole, this little part of the stem here, and indicative here. So where, where the, the base of the leaf comes together on both sides, this is an indication of a zinc deficiency. So one comes up here and the other comes out here. They don't match. Uh -huh. They're offset. So the petiole comes up here. They're not, they should, they should align, mm -hmm. but if they're off a little bit and maybe up to a quarter inch or so, that's a zinc deficiency. I believe the aflatoxins in grain was what brought on the witch trials. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay. So we got other deficiencies here. Uh, so this is a fi sufficient uh, zinc in a pea plant. And this is what it looks like when it's deficient. So it's got a lot of white around the perimeter there. So if you see that, you know, you need to add some zinc. And this is another indication of that too. You'll notice it's more on the perimeter. You'll see in some kind of uh, lighter color, a yellow or white in this case, around the perimeter, but all the veins are dark. So that's an indication of zinc as well. Uh, magnesium, uh, manganese, MN. So this is another transitional metal, uh, another 54. So we got another heavy one. And this would be what it looks like in its the form you'd buy it in. Another, I think, uh, manganese sulfate. And so you can see the density of there. It's quite a lot. Uh, it's needed for photosynthesis again. Remember I mentioned the two M's are good for photosynthesis. 
disease resistance, stress, carbohydrate production, and vegetable growth. Um, so for photosynthesis, um, it's used in the water splitting. So um, manganese is essential for water hydrolysis, which is the first step in photosynthesis. So it's a splitting off of the H. So H2O is water, two, one hydrogen and, no, two hydrogens and one oxygen. So the two is right after the H. Um, so you get an H and an HO. So it's splitting that off and those are needed for the photosynthesis process. So that's kind of what that's going on there, which is what I mentioned here. So that can be a limiting factor. If it doesn't have enough manganese, it can't photosynthesize. Um, it is essential to regulate potassium absorption. So you may have enough potassium, but if you don't have enough manganese, you're not going to get, the, get it into the plant where it's needed. And also uh, movement of sugar into the uh, sugar sinks in the leaves and the fruit. So that's an important one. To, if your fruit isn't getting sweet enough, that may be a deficiency. Um, and then here's a bunch of diseases that it prevents. It causes, allows resistance in the plant for those. Oh. Not bother to read them all off there, but you know, mildews and blights and things like that. And sorry, it's getting a bit long here. Malignanum, give you a little familiarity with some of these here, so they're not brand new to you. Okay, malignanum. Um, so another 95. Notice our weight is going up a little bit, it's a pretty heavy one. Um, so this is, you need quite a bit less, and this can be toxic to plants and humans in too high a quantity. Most things, there's a range where if they're not enough, there's problems, and if there's too much, they become toxic. Uh, this is one you need very little applied, like, a, what, an eighth of a teaspoon or so in my mix. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like. And then... It's all, uh, so nodulation, okay, here's a little picture of nodules. So this is a root hair, the lighter color tan. And then these um, pinkish red little um, structures are the little nodules that are storing nitrogen. So the bacteria is, has a symbiotic relationship with the plant to create these. And if there isn't enough malignanum, um, you'll get white or gray colored nodules instead of the nice pink red ones. And so they're not able to store as much nitrogen in that case. Um, and that's kind of what it says here. I'll just kind of summarize it for you. Um, soil's low. So, yeah, it's needed, needed for nitrogen fixing bacteria known as rhizobia. In the rhizosphere, rhizosphere meaning the, the sphere, uh, the soil right around the roots is the rhizosphere. So that's a term you'll probably hear many times. Rhizosphere is where all the good stuff happens around, that the plants need. They excrete their sugars and they get their minerals up through there. A lot of biological activity right in that rhizosphere area, right around the roots. And also in Increases plant resistance to uh, ver verticillium, uh, angular root spot, powdery mildew, um, and that one. All viruses inhibits nematodes since it has, has to do with the root zone a lot. You know, so it's going to inhibit the, probably the feeding of nematodes on the roots if there's enough malignanum in there. And I don't know the exact reason for that, but... That's, that's what we know for so far. And then cobalt. And I'm, you guys aren't reminding me here. <laughs> Zinc. Uh, malignanum. What else here? Manganese. Yeah, I'm not doing too well. <laughs> I'm getting behind we'll get here. <laughs> I'm clicking through here, forgetting, I'm trying to get through, and then Manganese. take a look here. And malignanum. And then we got cobalt. I like that one. 
like sparkly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that one dissolves in water nicely. <laughs> and then we got cobalt. This is For my... some reason, it seems like that should be blue. <laughs> cobalt? Yeah, they actually, so get this, they use it to make blue glass. Yeah, I, I <laughs> cobalt, blue it's Well, it, blue. it doesn't get that way. Apparently it's oxidized. They must have used a different form. Wow. And they probably take the oxygen out and it turns blue, <laughs> apparently. I wasn't able to find any pictures of that other than it. they showed a blue blue glass, a nice bright blue. But yeah, 1735 it was discovered. Another transition metal. Uh, 58, so it's kind of right up there with iron as far as the weight of it. Okay, so nodulation. So cobalt is needed for that and vegetative growth. So a little, little more limited, but it's still an important one. Um, inhibits the formation of ethylene and delays senescence. <laughs> Those are these big words. <laughs> so senescence means the mat it's maturation or maturing of the plant. So it's like the kind of like it's finishing up, getting to its full stage, or um, so it can slow that down. Um, I now ethylene is. Who knows what ethylene glass, gas, how, how that relates to fruit? Anyone recognize that one? No, no. No, so ethylene gas, um, bananas, apples, pears, all put off ethylene gas, but they also are affected by it. So it, ethylene gas is what people use to ripen fruit. Or if you put a banana that's putting off eth ethylene glass next to uh, an apple or something or an avocado or some other fruit <coughs> also affects vegetables. They'll rot faster. Mm. And so <clears throat> um, it's the cobalt. If you feed your plants cobalt, uh, it can slow down. So if you say, well, I really need to get it to not mature quite so fast or need to slow it down, it's more for farmers. You know, they want to get their crops mature just at the right time. Um, but it does slow down. So if you're trying to speed it up. Don't feed your plants cobalt just before they're ready to uh, mature. That would probably be a bad thing. So you want to do that more earlier on in the season. Make sure they have enough cobalt um, in, their, in their cells. Um, so plants need adequate levels of cobalt in order for growing root tips. So root stuff, again, nodulation related to that. But also in other plants that don't do that. Remember, it's only the legumes. Um, that are doing the nodulation and fixing of nitrogen. Um, and then synthesizing cytokinins, which regulate lateral root development. So for root growth, it's important. Um, and also for the top part of the plant, you'll get shorter internodes, so that between the, where the uh, buds and the leaf nodes come out. They'll be at the shorter distance between, like one, from one leaf to the next. Those are the internodes. That distance will be shorter, more compact, which is good, and more branching. A lot, lot more, you know, side branches coming off your your main stem. So that's that's a good aspect of it. Um, and then very strong reproduction. So it uh, increases the reproductive. Um, properties of the plant or increases its, uh, I guess, it sets more buds and sets more fruit, you could say. So earlier on in the season when it's, when it's in that stage, it would be a good time to apply it. And once all the fruit is set, like on a squash plant or to, tomatoes are more all over the whole season, so um, it'd be less of a problem for them. But you'd want to do it early on for something like squash or let's see what else here. Um, as far as fruit, let's see here. Cucumbers are kind of all season long too. So I'm not quite sure on that. But um, And then as far as application, how are we applying these things? Get familiar with your uh, sprayer here. So um, if you are going to use it for a foliar spray, it's best not to put herbicides at all in there, have a separate one. They're cheap enough, buy two, if you're gonna be spraying your other weeds with it. Um, so anyway, Chapin makes fairly good high quality ones. 
if you want a brand to look for that isn't going to crack or break on you easily. They pretty, make, all their stuff is pretty tough. Um, it is very good not to go as like, oh, let's get a fancy metal one. Well, <laughs> most of the time you're doing pesticides. You know, the people that use the metal ones, they're doing a lot of, you know, herbicides uh, too. And so you don't want to be using, you want to use something plastic for this kind of stuff we're spraying on there. It's all a lot of times salt related. Um, and uh, eat, will eat away and plug up a metal one fairly easily if you don't flush it out carefully each time and it's just usually not worth it. So um, even, you know, these are fairly tough anyway, the plastic on them. But I've had this for a couple years and it holds up fairly well. Um, <clears throat> and the sprayer, all the valve stuff, it seems to be fairly high quality. And you go back to that clip? Oops, sorry. What have we got here? Malignum. So this is kind of, not that you have to put all of this in all, all, the, you know, all the time, but if you were, these are kind of the, the amounts that you would use for a gallon. And then you just, um, so don't get confused by the half a gallon up here. <laughs> That's not the quantity. So this is more the application rate. Mm. So how much are you spraying and how quickly are you walking down that row? So you're going to, a lot of times you just want to, do water first and just kind of say, okay, we'll put, put a gallon in there and spray and then get it up, get a feel for how much you put, you've put, when it runs out, it's like, well, how much area did I cover? And kind of practicing, well, okay, so, you know, if you do it shh, down there, general speed, you can cover a 50 foot bed, uh, 125 square feet or so with about a half of a gallon. So, and that's for low plants. So your application weight rate would increase, like if you had tomato plants or some big lush cucumbers and things like that, uh, you're going to have to increase it, uh, probably double or maybe, maybe even two gallons for you know 125 square feet because you're going up and down the plants, getting underneath and around, and usually to the point that it's just starting to drip, is where you want the leaves to be, fairly saturated. Oh, and um, so, and then. It's, I, this is very difficult to do, <laughs> at least for me, but you want to do it in the evening. Uh, after 5 p.m. is the best time to spray. If you do it at midday, it's gonna, the water is going to evaporate fairly quickly. Maybe within 15 minutes it's all evaporated, or maybe in less. And that, as soon as it dries, the plants can no longer absorb it. So uh, you want to make sure that there's a longest window as, uh, as possible where that plant can be, it's in a liquid form on the leaves where the plant can be, you know, pulling that, those minerals in. Um, but, you know, that's not always a, <laughs> you're usually off in the house doing something else and forget about your garden in the evening time. So set an alarm, it says, oh, I want to spray my plants <laughs> in the evening. So it really does make a, a big difference. Or if you, if you forget and you really need to get out there in the morning, you can do it before 8 a.m. 8 a. usually. Um, usually the sun isn't terribly, still at a low angle, and you still usually has some dew on the leaves. You know, 7 a.m., get out there, get it before, give yourself a, an hour or a half hour or something to, to get everything mixed up because there is, there is a little bit of mixing time. Um, and as far as the... Let's see here, basalt. So linardite is the, is the secret ingredient and also a drop of soap. So any ideas why I would put soap in there? It's a sticker. Sticker, but well, it, it does a little bit, but the, the main function is, what is it called here? Um, oh, I'm forgetting the term. Um, so it, um, it basically cuts the surface tension down. Um, so that the, it doesn't just like, like, like a bead of water off a duck's back, mm -hmm. it'll fall right off that leaf. Mm -hmm. This will cut the surface tension, allow it to, the moisture, the little droplets to stay on the leaf and not just like roll off. Because if it all falls off the leaf, it's not helping it either. So, um, <laughs> emo, no, it's not an emulsifier. What is that? There's a term for that. But anyway, soap and then linardite. So humic and fulvic acid um, will convert, chelate is the term. It converts the minerals from a sulfate or oxidized form into a reduced form. 
So the reduced form is the form that the plants can utilize. So it's kind of like turn it in, let's see here, uh, example. So it takes this form, this is the form you buy it in and you want to convert it into like more of this form. So you're kind of taking the oxygen out. It forces it out of there. So that's, that's why we put that in there. It's the secret ingredient that you need in all your mixes in order to, otherwise it's going to be pretty, un, uh, pretty much, un, 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 the plant won't be able to use it, basically. And so it's ineffective. So what is that lunardite made out of? Um, so they pick, they, this is a mined product that they get out of the surface of coal mines. So when they find a layer of coal, like the top layer has this substance in there. <coughs> you can take a look at that if you haven't seen it. Um, and so the reason why um, we have to add it is because we're not using biology to create it. So in your compost pile, if you have a compost pile, and you put like a sieve or something and you run water through it, you'll notice all this brown liquid coming out. And if you recognize it, <clears throat> you get something very similar. You get these humic and fulvic acids coming out. The fungus produce them. And they're also a food for fungus too. And so normally those are in the soil produced by the fungus. And that's what allows the, a lot of the chelation of the changing of these, the minerals to the different forms um, is by the biology doing that for you. Well, on the leaves, you don't have the, you know, there's no fungus sitting in your tank to convert it for you. So we need to, um, you're, and this happens fairly quickly within, I think, like three or four minutes or something. Shake it all up and just let it sit there for maybe a minute or two and it's ready to go. I mean, basically you've, you put everything in there, by the time you get out to your garden to spray, you're good to go. It's already done the conversion process because um, we're not talking about large quantities and we're in a very liquid form. Um, but the form that is over there, you'll know, if you look, if you, if you touch it, it's, it's very non-toxic. I think you can even eat the stuff. Um, but it's got, it's got different sizes. It's not a complete powder, and I haven't found a source that has a nice powdery substance that won't clog your sprayer up. It gets in, it gets in little chunks, get in there, a little couple bigger ones get in there, and they'll plug it up and you'll be real frustrated. Unscrewing, blow it out, rinse it out, do something. <laughs> and it's a big pain. So I found out if you stick, so I take my um, teaspoon of it, I put it in a quart jar, put that in the blender and shove that on for a little bit. And any other things that uh, phosphorus, um, I don't know if that's phosphorus, <laughs> My, <laughs> potassium. <laughs> I think it's phosphorus is the P in there. But anyway, anything that's bigger in little rock chunks, well, if you can see right over here, um, these guys, and I, and I did try it and it was fine. So anything that looks like it may plug up your sprayer, cobalt, it's got some bigger chunks in there that I'd be wanting to throw in there too. Um, let's see here. So that one's fine. Phosphorus. Yeah. So the phosphorus, rock phosphate, generally the form it comes in, little chunks. It's fit, they're fairly soft. They won't dull your blade. Um, I actually don't see phosphorus on the list. Is it, should it be yeah, there? Yeah. That may have gotten missed or something like that. Um, so if you're doing this mixture, how much water are you doing that with? Okay. So that, that's a gallon. That's like a gallon. Yeah, okay. it's for one gallon of water. Okay. So you just double everything if, if you have two gallons. Okay. And the phosphorus would be how many teaspoons? Uh, that's a major one, so one teaspoon. Uh, well, you could even probably do two. Yeah, you could probably do two on there. It's There's no real, like, this is exactly how much you need. It's kind of all just kind of, a ratio. yeah, kind of a ratio and kind of like, yeah, about that much. Um, you know, the major ones, you can stick more, and then when you get down to malignum, you know, a little quarter teaspoon, you really take, um, yeah, quarter teaspoon. You know, most of us have little quarter teaspoons or something like that, or <clears throat> that's, but it kind of gives you a ratio of about a qu quarter of it <laughs> as compared to a, a full one for some of the other stuff. Um, yeah, most of the time. So I'm usually doing nitrogen, 
uh, iron, uh, mang manganese, and malignanum. Put those in there. Uh, that's malignanum, sorry. Um, ma magnesium. 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 Mag, M A G, magnesium. Mo mang manganese. Um, I haven't really done zinc. I haven't really seen super need for that. Most of the time, that they seem to have enough zinc. It's not a super critical one. Um, um, and then I usually throw in some molybdenum, uh, copper. That's an easy one, and sulfur. This should probably be up top here with these other ones that got stuck down there. In the order I put them in, or somebody else already had them in there. Um, so basically, I took a uh, application rate per acre and converted it down to something that's a little more manageable. And it's all done by like weight. <laughs> this many grams per oh. this. And so I had to like, it's like, okay, is it about that? <laughs> and try to figure out the different weights. And so it was kind of a pain to try to get an estimate, but it's obvious, it doesn't have to be exact either, but you know, try to figure out, okay, which ones can we do a full teaspoon? Which ones do I need a quarter? So it seems to be about the ratio is a quarter of the, It would probably be the same as the potassium. So two, two teaspoons could be put on the list there. Um, let's see here. So phosphorus, yeah. So if you're seeing the purple, a lot of times on the tomatoes, you'll see the purple underneath the leaves when they're really fairly young. You know, maybe that six inches or less tall. And they're not looking too good. You could, that's a, how you could add, give them a little spray. In fact, what's in here is what I left over from spraying my, my onions. So I've sprayed them a couple times now just to give them a, a boost and make sure they're, they have everything they need. Um, so I think that is... Okay, so then other sources here. Sorry, <laughs> 7.30. We're not going too long here, but... Okay, so other sources. So you can pass these around. Okay. There's the last two here on the list. So sources of minerals. So here, here's the long list of what's in basalt. And you know, it's cut off at the bottom because it's another five or six elements that oh <clears throat> are not you know, very trace elements, but they're there. So you notice 46% is silicon. So that's is a very good source to add to your soil. Um, I, probably not a, I don't know how well it would work and it wouldn't work in the blender well and you're going to have to screen it heavily in order to not plug it up so it's it's mainly a something that you add to your soil um, so that if your soil is deficient in stuff you can kind of amend it plus it also helps with breaking up the clay and making it more of a loam so your soil isn't so sticky if you have that problem depends on where you're what elevation you are in if you're down you know by the river down here then you don't have that problem at all but for those of us that are a little higher elevation. Um, and then Himalayan salt, you get sodium, calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, fluoride, cadmium, palladium, and then aluminum. So it's got, got a good range, 80 or so minerals. I can only get find a list of 24. Nobody had the full list, so this is what you get. <laughs> this is all I could find. And it does have iodine in there for those that were I don't know how, what the quantity is. Again, this, I, they just gave me a numbered list where the, I was able to actually get parts per million and percentages for basalt, but not for Himalayan salt. But So that, that's usually something I add. Uh, did I have that on the list? <coughs> Apparently not. Um, what is it, about a teaspoon? Yeah, it varies. Um, you can decide how much you need in there. I don't really know the exact amount, but it doesn't harm it at that rate. About a teaspoon of the Himalayan salt is a good to add in my mix there. I should have added it here on the list, but this is more of a copy paste and took a lot of work to get all this together. Um, so anyway, those are the, the two things that, um, anyway, so that's all I have for you tonight. But kind of a, gives you an overview <laughs> of some of these minerals. And yeah. 
So anyway, so that's lots of different uses. So then molasses would be the other thing that has minerals in there and also feeds the plant. So eventually I'll get a full list of <laughs> do an actual example of a spray that I would normally put out there, but I just was kind of doing a copy paste and this was kind of at the end after I got all the other stuff done. Um, yeah, put all the together, but it gives you a you know familiarity with some of these minerals and what they are and the, one, the ones we need to pay attention to. So my list is definitely not up to, I don't think I have all six, 17 there. There's so a which ones, if you did the molasses, which ones does that take the place of? Or does it? Mm, I don't know. I haven't looked up the whole list of okay. what is in molasses and which ones. Sulfur, I think, is high on the list. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, there's quite quite a few in there. Yeah. So and it's in a fairly good form. So if if you're feeling poor, you just want to spray molasses. You can do fairly <laughs> well. Or molasses and the Himalayan salt, you can do fairly well. They're not going to have as high quantities as, you know, a full teaspoon or something like that. So you're going to be able to get a little bit more to the plants. And how many times a year? Um, usually during the beginning of the growing season, it's like once a week or every two weeks. And then you can taper off as the plants are doing well. Or if you see, you know, hey, we got an infestation of some kind of um, those little creatures that suck, whatever they... Um, aphids so if you see aphids showing up that means hey you got some deficiencies and <clears throat> i'll also show, show you guys a, a health pyramid and some of the things that when you reach certain levels you can tell tell what your plant is probably deficient in and what level of health it's a operating at based off the pests that are able to attack it um, different pests have different levels of digest or different abilities in their digestive tract to um, handle eating your plants. Some of they like caterpillars have a certain level that they can digest um, um, plants that are a certain level of health because so they're looking for different types of substances. Um, let's see how do I explain it? Carb uh, complex carbohydrates. A lot of the caterpillars aren't able to digest. They're looking for, and I'm forgetting all this information. It's been so long since I've thought about it. Um, I might have to talk about that another time. <laughs> I'll, um, do some more, more, more relearning because a lot of the information kind of goes and it's like, I can't remember it all. Um, but beetles are kind of like the, the top. They, they can handle a lot. So when you're attacked by a beetle, that doesn't mean your plants are overly sickly and you know about ready to die. That means they're probably pretty healthy, but they're just not quite at the level where um, it defends off the beetles. But there is a level of health where even the beetles will, will stop and it's no longer a food source for them. So it's encouraging, but the um, slugs, I think, will also, yeah, slugs also will stop at a certain stage of health. Well, they'll, they won't be able to digest the food anymore. So there's, you know, if you, you know, as plants He's get healthier. So anyway. Do so you know what you're going to talk about next time? Yep. Let's see, is there a way to get to the beginning? So we covered all this. Flash. <laughs> a lot of information. It is a lot of information. Okay. Yeah. Probably overloaded you. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> should, should have done it maybe in two. Maybe we'll just do it all again another another week, right? <laughs> Go over it all again. Okay, so soil. So we got the overview of minerals. We kind of understand what some of the minerals are. Yes. There's your minerals again. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, some major ones. Boron, copper, chlorine, iron, zinc, nickel, manganese, molybdenum, cobalt, silicon, selenium, and sodium. So you get a little bit of sodium in with your uh, Himalayan salt. So a little that they need there. So, so we covered and so we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the soil and how we can encourage the soil to uh, convert some of those minerals that are in the soil.
since we can't, we could actually feed the plants fairly well by spraying them all the time. That that would be get kind of frustrating and annoying, and have to sit there and spray them every three days in order to keep up with their nutritional needs. So we want to encourage the biology to go down there, and they, and that will so it actually will drive the biology by if when you get the photosynthesis process going well by feeding the minerals that it needs. It'll send sugars down into the roots, and then it'll encourage all that biology down there to start feeding the minerals back up. And then you just—it's like you're starting the car, and it runs and it keeps on going. It's kind of a cycle there. So that's really the cool. the beauty of it that you don't have to like force feed it unless your soil is just completely de depleted and it's like sand. You're trying to grow them in. Yeah, you could you could have to feed them every three days in order to keep them alive, because or there's soils dead completely and there's just no life. You know, it can try to get a little life going, but it's still not gonna do do a very good job. So anyway, I probably kept you long enough here. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So I guess let's finish with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we could learn about all the different elements and um, how we can help plants to get going and to give them what they need. And pray that you would help us to remember some of this information and be able to apply it and have a slow process of making it, making that information ours that we can share it with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for bringing all these samples. Yeah, I know. That's a lot of work. Interesting. Yeah.